There are so many aspects of uh, redistribution, future of distribution of documentary, and we want to take a broader scope right now um, uh, through the asymmetrical gap between Global North and Global South. And uh, we want to explore new and equal uh, business models to a more, well, symmetrical co-production, so to speak. So what we're going to have now is, uh, is the next panel. Um, I will leave the floor in a second, or rather I will leave the screen in a second, to Hendrik Underbjörg, who is a film producer and also advisor for documentary film program at the International Media Support. The uh, IMS, the International Media Support, is um, a media development organization. You probably know them. They enable local media to reduce conflict, uh, strengthen democracy, and uh, facilitate dialogue with film productions. And these film productions, most of the time, are focusing on current affairs, gender equality, cultural diversity, and human rights. A lot of subjects which are highly interesting, of course, for you here, the audience, uh, documentary filmmakers who want to make an impact on society. And this is exactly what we are discussing here at the CPH conference. So I will uh, have in a second um, Hendrik Underberg, as I was saying, and he will be joined by Cara Mertes, Director of Moving Image Strategies for Foundation, Miriam Sassine, producer about production. Teresa Erfurt de Turingano, full funding executive at the Median Board Berlin Brandenburg. Oh, someone also from Berlin. And um, Neka Luke, who is a film strategist, Hello. producer uh, from the Caribbean. And I will leave the floor in a second. If you are ready for redistribution, symmetrical co production, a new and equal um, business um, model. Yes. Welcome, welcome. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening uh, to everybody. Thanks a lot for, to Copenhagen Docs for creating this opportunity. I will tell you where I come from, but first of all, I would like to thank you all for tuning in. And I'll also like to give a warm welcome to Kara Mertes from Ford Foundation, Miriam Sassin, independent producer from Barry Ruth, Nika Luke, screen industries consultant from Trinidad and Tobago, and Teresa Höfer de Turegano from Medienburg, Berlin, Brandenburg. Thanks for taking your time and sorry for not having a couple of hours to discuss this. Mm. Yeah, the time is of essence and what I hope to, that we can achieve within this half an hour is to contribute to an examination of how we work together, how we co-produce between what you can call the Global South and the Global North. <clears throat> we focus on documentaries here, but to my knowledge, I've been producing some 40 plus films. Uh, this discussion is equally re relevant when it comes to fiction films. Um, then, yeah, my name is Henry Gonnerbjerg, and I work from, for IMS and uh, in the, uh, International Media Support. We are a media development organization, and we take part in this dialogue because some of our core values deals with strengthening the original voices, independent voices, and we also have a very strong view on sustainability. And this also, of course, goes for sustainability when we're talking about business models. I know this session is going to be on speed, and I'm not sure that we'll have the time to answer questions from audiences, but please state them anyways. I can see them on my screen next to me here. Um, <clears throat> and if we do have the time, we'll do it. Uh, otherwise, I'll be happy to answer any questions after the session. In any case, please reach out to me after the session. I'll be happy for any input. Uh, and uh, dear panel, please interrupt me uh, or chip in whenever you, you want to. But we, um, the title of this session is Symmetrical Co-Production. But what it actually needs is a question mark, because the question is, if we are symmetrical in our current deal structure. This has been a, a question in the documentary industry for years, and we have been trying to address this through 
uh, codex and encouragements, but to be fair, nothing has really changed so far. So in this session, we'll try to look more on the money side of the deals. <clears throat> uh, I briefly mentioned that I have produced uh, a lot of films uh, and I've also worked as a co-producer from North when the majority producer was from South. And my experience is that even with the modest contribution from my home turf in Europe, uh, it has given me a significant position in, in the revenue stream. And I found that to be actually a bit awkward in one, in one way. But on the other hand, it sort of sharpened my, my attention. It put me on track to, uh, you know, diving into what kind of deals that you really make. Um, because I'll go into a bit nitty gritty stuff. I had two slides and then I'll come over to my panel here. <clears throat> but it's a bit nerdy, uh, nitty gritty, but you know, uh, as in many other cases, the devil is in the detail. Uh, as it is, is now, we usually in the industry split the rights to a film, you know, the rights to take part in the revenue streams according to the financing each co-producer brings to the table. And maybe we can have slide one coming in here. Yeah, here we go. This is very simplified. This is a very simplified thing here. What, what we have is that that is an example of a producer who wants to enter a co-production to do the sound design. <clears throat> and you have the, the co-producers, but uh, the producer's budget in the middle here. If let's say the co-producer is from North and no, the producer is from North and the co-producer is from North as well, then in this example, the sound design takes up 20% of the budget, but <clears throat> uh, the co-producer from North comes in with a financing that equals that work and acquires 20% of the rights. Uh, and this is sort of, this seems fair also because uh, in North we have sort of uh, very comparable GNPs, we've got very comparable uh, or fixed uh, currency rates. But if we go to, no, uh, but if the, if the um, co-producer if the producer is from south then and goes to a co-producer from north, then the co-pro comes in with 20% of the original budget. But given the cost in north that are so much more expensive than in south uh, and the financing that goes along with this, all of a sudden the co-producer from north end up getting 35% uh, of the rights to the revenue streams. Uh, we can call this a currency-based model, uh, and uh, to the effect is actually, as you can see, this very simplified example is that in most cases the producer from the south, south is uh, thinned out in the process. So what we what we want to discuss here, and if I can have have slide two, please. Yeah. We, we, it's basically the same example, but just uh, in, in a, what we call a value-based value, value -based model. In the value-based model, um, you have the scenario where North is co-producing with North and, and the split of revenue rights is the same, it's still 20%. But in the case where you, make your, where you found your deal structure on a value-based model, you uh, and co-produce from south to north, then no matter what the costs are uh, in north uh, and the, the financing that goes along with that, uh, the co-producer from north gains 20% of the rights, which equals the, the value that you bring to the film. So this value-based model does not thin out the producers from south. Instead, it levels them with the producers from north and, and to the effect that the original filmmakers is sort of reconnected to the revenue streams. So this is what uh, we would like to examine in this, what we have left, 24, 24 minutes. Uh, and I hope that you can help me qualify the examination of these models, which is the most symmetrical and will this symmetry be for better or for worse? So, uh, Miriam Sassin, you are uh, an independent producer from Beirut, Lebanon, and I guess that your call will be to strengthen anything that can, uh, that you will embrace anything that can strengthen the production environments in South. 
But be, to be concrete, what is your experience when co-producing from with with producers from north, and what is sort of the standard career outcome when a filmmaker gains success in in gaining the financing from north? Thank you, Hendrik. Um, I'm I'm very happy to be participating in this talk as um this what this topic has been actually taking a lot of my time um as a producer based in lebanon i live in a country where there is no public funding uh and the only way i can make a film is through co-productions uh, so of course i'm eligible to get grants from a few uh, funds that i can spend in my country but most of the time these are not enough and i need to co-produce to be able to finish the film um, and so i i have been co-producing a lot and often i'm um, facing this struggle of seeing like um, this unbalance in the profit share uh, or the, the stream of revenues because sometimes like I spend let's say uh, four years developing a project and bringing it together etc but I cannot finish it without co-production and then a co-producer comes in and as you mentioned um, in your in your scheme like they bring in money, but with this money comes spending obligations, and with this spending obligations comes prices that are set, and therefore the budget becomes higher, and there's like the 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 co-producer share becomes bigger, and I feel I have worked a lot, and and the 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 balance of work we both provided to the film is not the same, but. The, the the share of revenues is split just according to financials. Uh, so this is something that has, is a very frustrating. It's also frustrating on other levels because a lot of the times the money also I can access is equity money uh, because we don't have public funding. And when, when I'm getting equity money, I also have to share my profits with the investors, whereas the co-producer doesn't have to because he's getting soft money. Uh, the third uh, inconvenience is um, because I live in a country where there is no industry infrastructure, so we have don't really have rules. And when I'm co-producing, I'm co-producing most of the time with countries who have rules, who have a system. And therefore, most of the time, we need to follow their rules. And that means uh, us finding ways and compromising and negotiating, let's say, to make savings because the total budget is, let's say, $100,000 and we can't go above it. So I have to negotiate with the people who are working in Lebanon uh, to reduce their prices because we cannot reduce the prices that are, uh, let's say, in Europe. And therefore, the technicians here make the sacrifices and my, my share is diminished uh, because I, now we spend less in my country uh, or we, and we use less of the money that I have brought in, etc. So in, in many ways, there is a bit of unfairness in the process. And that has been the discussion of many uh, other producers I have talked to from the Arab world where we all start thinking like we need to figure out ways to maybe not co-produce because most of the time it's to our disadvantage but at the same time we we most of the time we need it we don't have other options we don't find enough money uh, we don't have enough resources or sometimes like we need to work with certain people who are uh, talents from abroad and we need to have these co-productions uh, but for example mm, most recently Miriam, on a uh, film uh, yes oh sorry uh, i just uh, wanted to to, to ask you one, one, one little bit question more because uh, last year in August you had this big explosion in, in Beirut with which both uh, destroyed a lot uh, of lives and a lot of uh, things in the harbor and, and but but another, on the other hand I guess you were at that point also working on a film and your currency dropped so what happened there? Um, what happened on, on that uh, film is that our currency, like, was it, it was starting to drop 
already at the beginning of the year, uh, and then it dropped massively. Uh, the money we had was not enough, so we had to br bring in a new co-producer, and with this co-production came extra spending obligations. So that also like diminished my parts because I, uh, I am responsible for this film. I need to make it, make it happen. We had already raised funding uh, for it, and I needed to compensate the loss I had from the money I had raised. But that was through bringing a new co-producer who ended up raising around 15% of the film, and that was an additional 15% I had to, to give up uh, because I couldn't ask for my other co-producers to, to give up this money. And today our budget is much higher than what I had originally set, um, let's say early 2019 before going into production. Yeah. Um, Teresa, I heard that you were know, uh, When we first got, got in contact, I felt very lucky meeting you. It was Tina Fisher from Copenhagen Dogs who pointed me in your direction because I've, I discovered that you actually did a thesis uh, some years ago on South North co-productions. And now you're working with the public funding, with public funding through Medienborg uh, Berlin Brandenburg. Uh, as a public funder, you have a very wide mandate in, in, in uh, Berlin Brandenburg. So what, so what are your learnings? What are you f uh, I remember that one of your findings in your thesis was that there were huge problems with sustainability of business in South. But uh, in the past 12 years, you've been working in uh, the median board. What, what, is your, what is your learnings from there? What are your learnings? Uh, thank you, Henrik. Um, let me start by saying to Medium and saying hello to all of the other panelists who we've met at various times. I, I feel like um, Medium addressed me somehow directly in certain ways because we've been involved in the funding of uh, a number of productions where Abut was also involved in. But I think we'll um, deal with that uh, in the second question or in another part uh, because I would love to address this issue of spending obligations and recoupment and things like that. Absolutely important. But um, to answer Henrik's question, let me start by saying that um, it's important I have a past uh, having worked on international co-productions, North South or European funding for films of the global South. Um, the work I do at Medium Board, and maybe that's a key issue or a key, key point to start with, is that Medium Board uh, is a public, regional public fund uh, based in Berlin. It's very international, uh, but nonetheless, it has no specific mandate to support films from the global South. So we're not at all in the same um, sort of in the same context as uh, the World Cinema Fund or Hubert Baz or the various numerous funds um, that exist around the world that are specifically uh, designed to support films of the global south. So that itself I think is um, an important point uh, and shows that there are changes in the the um, in the sort of the landscape, the film funding landscape in the north, where it's just not an issue. We're looking at projects and wherever they come from, we're looking at them. Um, in terms of sort of an overall glimpse of the situation, um, you know, a lot of things seem to me have remained the same. There, but on the other hand, there have been some changes. So um, if we're looking at it in the north, I would say um, there's a cute, huge, oh my, mm. I was going to sneeze, but I'm not going to. Okay. Um, huge amount of funding and money still concentrated in the North and more and more as we're seeing right now, that's the tendency in the industry. Um, the nice thing to see <coughs> is that, um, there is, I get the feeling with all of the changes that are happening now, um, there is a moment where I'm slowly starting to see more attention um, in classical institutions being given to uh, questions of diversity. So in terms of Berlin um, and in Germany, certainly in Berlin, you know, there's a fair amount of attention given to issues or, or projects, uh, you know, gen like gender, attention to gender and attention to LGBTQ, LGBTQI, um, 
so that's already there and slowly I would say um, that there is more attention now being given to questions of diversity. And that's a very positive thing to see. In terms of the, on the other hand, in terms of the South uh, continuity and um, change, I would say that, look, I, I think there, I think we have, we are seeing various hubs um, where things are changing in South Africa and Nigeria and various places around the world. So there, there is some, um, there are some changes that are very encouraging. On the other hand, um, so many things which, which um, through all these years that I've been working in the industry still remain the same. Um, an example in Cannes last year uh, where I, stepped in to listen to some um, panels on, on black filmmakers and black filmmaking. Um, I was saddened to hear exactly the same things that I'd heard 20 years ago. Um, so, you know, that those things don't change, but, um, and maybe a final point is to come to what you mentioned about the lack of sustainability, that those things that haven't changed is once again, the certain types of accusations of European funding vis-a-vis -vis films of the global south. Um, I think that there are so many misconceptions. Uh, of course, certain things are, are you know, there are, uh, well, let's say that I, I feel that there are very many misconceptions about how the funding works um, on the one hand. And then the other thing is that still there's, you still see a focus um, on directors and the talent as opposed to supporting the industry of developing a sustainable industry. Uh, that means all of the partners, uh, producers, and uh, all of the other aspects that are necessary in the industry or all the other people. Um, there aren't enough uh, companies like uh, Abut, Miriam Sassin. Um, there are, you know, so many, they're so crucial to the development of an industry in order to lobby the government for funding, for um, setting regulations or rules in putting them in place. And with the focus only on directors um, and supporting and giving money for directors, all these years, um, yeah, there's a real hole there that needs to be filled. And that, um, yeah. yeah, that <clears throat> is, seems to be changing very slowly. Thanks. Thanks for this. Maybe, maybe in Nika Luke, I can, I can, uh, I can turn to you because you have you have a vast experience from funding of documentaries and fiction in Trinidad and Tobago, and knows knows the Caribbean region very good. So you have worked with sort of give and take all kinds of co-productions. Um, you also been witnessing a lot of tax credits, which is uh, public money spent uh, on the industry. But does does this um, build the industry, and what kind of industry does it build to you in your perception and your experience? And and what about the content production? So thanks for having me, Henrik, and um, hello to the rest of the panel. I'm happy to be on this conversation. Um, I think for Trinidad and Tobago and the Caribbean, um, where I would say even a, because from the point of view of producers being able to access opportunities to even co-produce or to find financiers or potential investors in their content, I think that has been one of the biggest challenges. So um, in the other mechanisms, because the interest is there in creating content and, and films have been made under different circumstances. For example, in Trinidad and Tobago, um, we've had an industry here, or the, 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 the basis of an industry here, I would say, for about 50 years. The first feature film was made in Trinidad and Tobago uh, 50 years ago. And over that time, even with limited infrastructure, you've had nearly 80 feature films that have been made in Trinidad and Tobago alone. Um, we have a cash-based rebate system in Trinidad and Tobago that has allowed some producers to be able to make their films. But with that funding, which is public funding, um, the other options that would normally be done in the US and Europe where you can put money together from various sources, that has definitely been a challenge here. And um, Trinidad and Tobago, and I think certainly the rest of the Caribbean by extension. Um, so development of the industry for local producers, meaning Caribbean based producers has been limited and difficult. The other issue I think is apart from the challenges of creating the content, 
um, the Caribbean simply is not or has not been a focus uh, when it comes to distribution and exhibi exhibition of content. So you have film festivals in the Caribbean that have been the main platforms where people who are able to make content, they come out of film schools in the Caribbean and they want to actually have a career in this, in this area. A lot of them make films for the festivals in the Caribbean and then those films don't generally go anywhere else. Um, and that I think is, is, is a challenge. So overall, in terms of there are trade agreements or there is a trade agreement from the, Car in the Caribbean between EU countries and Caribbean countries that on paper allows for a greater um, connection into e European resources to be able to create more Caribbean content and get it out to the world. But it's been widely um, acknowledged that that services component of the economic partnership agreement has not really been utilized and so definitely has been underutilized. And in large part, it would seem up to a UNESCO did a study up to 2019 that shows that um, it remains uh, underutilized and remains largely, I think, in the hands of the European partners to create the opportunities for this for more co-productions to happen so i would say that the there's there's interest in creating content there are some mechanisms in place in the caribbean i mentioned the rebate in trinidad and tobago as one of them but that idea of connecting the caribbean and the content that's being created here out to the rest of the world um that that continues to continues to be a bit of a disconnect Oh, thank, thank you a lot for this insight. Uh, Kara, Kara Mertes, as a project project director for Ford Foundation's Moving Images Strategies, I guess you spent your waking in hours fighting inequality, aiming for social justice. Uh, a tool like this on paper, a value-based model, could become a part of the solution, but is it relevant now, for, seen from your perspective, and how will this fit into the responses of the most pressing challenges that we face in the industry right now? Fantastic. Um, I hope you can hear me. Thank you, Henrik, and hello to all the panelists. It's really great to be listening to this panel. And also, I got to hear a bit of the previous panel uh, that Carolina ran. And I think putting the two together, actually, there are some really fantastic insights that are moving in a similar direction, actually. So at Ford Foundation, which is a private foundation operating out of the United States, but with 10 global offices, Ford has historically been one of the only uh, private foundations with a standing commitment to social justice documentary storytelling. Its latest incarnation is the Just Film Fund, which I used to direct. And what I'm doing now is actually working with the international programs because there has been a sort of realization on my part and the part of a lot of my colleagues and also filmmakers around the world that that the documentary, the will to documentary, if you will, to make documentary um, as a way to express the experience of yourself or your community is a global phenomenon. And increasingly the voices we need to hear that are not represented are Global South voices, which is how Henrik and I started talking about this kind of change, I would say. There's a kind of move to actually what I would call uh, thinking about a more international infrastructure. And with that, you get a kind of set of international, potentially, one of the things I was going to suggest is thinking about a set of international s standards, not just global north, global south, in order to reimagine, uh, if you will, a career sustainability that can function across the regions that have standing national funds, but to actually lift it up a level and say, listen, we're globally connected. Our challenges are common across country, across region, across population. Our will to this kind of storytelling also is well distributed around the planet. People really want to make this kind of work. They want to build resources. They want to uh, be in this industry in a way that's sustainable. And it's simply not in so many ways. It's ad hoc. It's informal. In some places, it's a kind of gig economy. Um, so there are multiple challenges. But I do think that the first thing that a foundation can do is help to imagine 
what a new way forward in the 21st century uh, would actually look like that isn't quite so piecemeal, it, that really responds to, as I say, this, this will to tell these stories and share them globally uh, and have a space whether we call it a public space or in the public interest. I, I hesitated to call it public television because that's really a 20th century answer to this question and maybe part of the new answer. I hope so. Signe was very passionate about defending the space of public media infrastructure as a very valuable space. And I agree with that. But I do think we have to kind of reframe and think differently and think at this much more global level. So I'll leave it with that. Henrik, is that, uh, unless you you have further questions. It's a lot on being uh, <clears throat> they are sort of patting my shoulder from from the uh, <laughs> from the festival side. We are well into well into the audience's question question time, but uh, so we'll just have I'll have to answer those uh, later. But just a quick round here. Um, Nick, do you see a, a Nick, do you see a problem in the current production climate in the region and? Um, and what, what could be changed here? Uh, this should be very, very brief, almost a yes, no. <laughs> um, yeah, there are definitely challenges with production in the region, mainly access to resources and financing. There are limited options to get financing for productions. It's mainly through public funding, whether through the rebate in Trinidad and Tobago or in other places in the Caribbean, it might simply be cobbling together private funds, sponsorship from companies, that kind of thing. But that approach obviously is not sustainable. Um, so production right now, I would say, has slowed down significantly. I, you know, There hasn't been a major feature length production, either narrative or documentary um, in Trinidad and Tobago in the last couple of years. And that's been exacerbated by the COVID-19 pandemic. Thank you, Miriam. Miriam, can I come to you? Would if if this um, sort of value-based uh, business model would become a standard in cooperation and co-production? Would you fear that uh, sources of financing would dry out? Seen from your perspective. Um. From my perspective today, sources of, of financing are already drying up. Uh, and this is what makes us look into other sources and other uh, models and, and to be a bit more resourceful. Um, I believe people who enter co-productions, like the co-producers we work with, they are not in it just for, you know, for the, 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 the profits and nor the funds also. Like, it, they don't care about the revenue uh, shares that the co-producers will get more about like the spending obligations in the system in, in their countries. So I believe there is something to do there with this proposition um, you are giving that can uh, be a good compromise to everyone without like compromising the, the co-production in general. Uh, Teresa, we're a bit on speed here, but, but could a value-based model in any, in any way become an advantage for a public funder like uh, Medienburg Berlin Brandenburg? Um, uh, very quickly, I mean, uh, look, trying to deal with the question of more equitable allocation of rights is absolutely crucial. I think the timing is also good, given the huge discussion right now in the industry about rights. So may as well uh, tackle it now. I wanted to give an example. Um, since we spoke, Henrik, I, I started asking some of the indie producers that I know who have co-produced with countries of the South or producers in, in uh, the global South. And exactly like two, both of them, uh, two examples where they independently negotiated the, the, the rights um, for the rest of the world, for the uh, recoupment rights independently um, negotiated them with the co-producer. I'll give an example, a uh, Berlin-based co-producer co -producer with a producer from Uruguay. Instead of splitting the rights, sharing the rights uh, proportionally to uh, the, the percentages of co-production, they just decided and worked it out in the co-production agreement and in the recruitment schedule that the Uruguay producer would get the rights for in the entire region of Latin America. That to do that in a way that seemed more 
equal or see, see more reflective of the, the input of the value um, that was being put in. So, uh, and, and that is something that, you know, as a film fund, well, we, we signed off on the recoupment plan. So I'm not saying that uh, it's so easy to be flexible and everything, but um, there are, and I have some other examples. So this, uh, you know, discussion about rights, it's absolutely worth, uh, worth having and, worth trying to negotiate and and talking to um you know the funders and um uh, you know it's not easy but i think it's absolutely crucial i think it's uh yeah crucial <laughs> yeah it's crucial to be crucial uh, thanks thanks a lot uh, my my screen is blinking blinking red so so uh, this was definitely a panel on speed uh, thanks thanks a lot for all your input i hope this conversation can continue uh, personally, I hope that that symmetrical co-producing co -producing could be for the film industry what Max Havilah was for coffee. Uh, and, and furthermore, it's very sort of important to underline that this is not a concept owned by anyone, but it's free of charge. And I hope that we can continue the development of things here with interested uh, people and organizations. So a warm thanks to you, Karen Mertes, Miam Sassin, Nick Luke. And Teresa Hufa de Turegano, thanks a lot, and to all the audiences, and enjoy the rest of the festival. Thanks a lot. And thank you to you also, Edric, for this uh, wonderful conversation. I know it was short, and I know it was uh, quite a few perspectives, but they were, were very important, and you did that really well.